A brief and bitter presidential campaign comes to a close. What does the positioning of Enrique Capriles and Nicolas Maduro tell us about the journey ahead for Venezuela? And an insight into the appeal of Chavismo. We take a tour around a poor Caracas neighborhood but see many changes. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. A little more than a month after the death of Hugo Chavez, and Venezuela will soon name his successor. The clear favorite is the acting president, Nicolas Maduro, who's promised to continue Chavez's Bolivarian revolution. Frankly, the race hasn't been close, but it has been colorful with insults flying between both candidates. The opposition leader, Enrique Capriles, has made various attempts to mock his rival, whether over Maduro's former career as a bus driver or for his claim that the spirit of Chavez had approached him in the form of a bird. Maduro, for his part, has hit back, calling Capriles a prince of the bourgeoisie. Coming so soon after the last presidential election and with such a short time frame, it was perhaps too much to expect a truly substantive debate about the many serious issues facing Venezuela. Nonetheless, what can we glean about the future strategies of both government and opposition in the post-Chavez world from their election campaigns? Al Jazeera correspondents attended both candidates' final rallies. First, Gabriel Elizondo with the Maduro camp. We're here in the middle of well over a million people here at the last Nicolas Maduro campaign rally. And Maduro's closing message is very simple. It said, a vote for him is basically an extension to, of the Chavez legacy here in Venezuela, a legacy that resonates with millions of people in this country. We talked to several of Maduro's supporters. We said, why are you voting for him? They said, because he represents Hugo Chavez. It's a wild and crazy scene here. Now we go over to my colleague, Teresa Bo, who's with the Capriles campaign. This has been a short, intense, and aggressive campaign. Enrique Capriles has traveled all around the country to convince people to vote for him. He has taken this campaign to a personal level, walking to every house and talking to people about their everyday problems like inflation and crime. He has stayed away for criticizing late President Hugo Chavez and from criticizing the revolution. But he has criticized Nicolás Maduro, saying that he's unfit to replace uh, Hugo Chavez. Enrique Capriles has asked people to create what are known as family commands to protect the voting that will take place on Sunday, in spite of the optimism that he has, that he can actually win this election on Sunday. Nicolás Maduro continues to be at least 10 points ahead. Supporters of Hugo Chávez often point to how much he changed the lives of Venezuela's poor for the better. Someone well-placed to witness that change was American Charles Hardy, a Catholic priest sent to live in one of Caracas's slums. He's stayed in the country ever since, and he invited Inside Story America's cameras around his old neighborhood and first described conditions nearly 30 years ago in the days before Chavez. My name is Charlie Hardy. I was born in Wyoming, uh, lived there most of my life. Back in the 60s, this group of missionaries came to Venezuela and they decided we will just live in the barrios among the people. And that's how I had the privilege of coming and living in Nueva Tocada. This whole area was built when oil money was pouring into the country. Government housing project, <laughs> built in the late 70s. This, this water tank, we never had water. But a contractor got a contract to build a water tank. It never had water in it. So, so, so that company or that person made lots of money, but it was of no use whatsoever to the people here. Where I lived was right here. This is a piece of carton, cardboard pressed. What we had was just this, this thick. And the government just put down a slab of cement and some wood posts and then tacked this on to the walls. I've never met more wonderful people in my life. But it wasn't fair, the conditions they had to live under. 
We had no water, no sewers. Um, our electricity we stole. And the thing is, we really felt things would never change. We, we kept fighting. We fought for housing, but outside of here. We didn't want more houses here. We knew they wouldn't last. And when you look at the history of this place, they didn't last. The buildings crumbled, the mountain, there were landslides. Chavez was elected in 1998. He became president in February of 1999. A few months after that, he came here to Nueva Tacagua and they dynamited one of the buildings because he did not want this place to go on existing. He wanted people to have dignified houses, okay? But in December 15th of 1999, there were massive landslides in Venezuela. Uh, maybe 50,000 people died one night, okay? Hundreds of thousands of people lost their homes. The idea of the government was when people lost their homes, they should be able to move into a, a new home. A, a few years ago, I heard about this Ciudad Caribia, where Chavez had a dream of building a new socialist city. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to see as we went up the mountainside, the road was being built. And then I'd have to say I was really in, in shock. Uh, there's community centers, the, 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 uh, again, seeing people who lived in Tacagua. I mean, it was neat, you know, come, come. Oh, can't you stay for supper and, and look at this. And uh, it, it was just so beautiful being inside there. Life has changed. And for the people who are still here, they're talking about about three, four months from now, they're going to have new apartments with three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and they're looking forward to it, as we were looking forward to it 25 years ago. Life has changed dramatically, and it's basically because of Hugo Chavez. No, no government had ever done anything like this for the people before. When I left here, after eight years, you know, I came as a Catholic priest, and when I left here, I was still Catholic priest functioning. Um, some people think the work of a missionary is to make conversions. I know of only one conversion, and that was of myself. Joining me as we look ahead to Sunday's election are from Caracas, Alex Main from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He's in Venezuela working as an electoral monitor. Also in Caracas, David Smaldi, senior fellow at the Washington Office on Latin America. And here in the studio, Carl Meacham, director of the Americas program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Alex Main, first of all, um, how would you characterize this very brief election campaign? Well, far too brief. Obviously, in two weeks, it's, it's hard to hold a decent campaign. I think that's big, been a big frustration of both of the candidates who are at this point completely exhausted. We haven't heard from them at all today. Uh, they finished up the campaign uh, yesterday. But also, I mean, you can really see it as an extension of the campaign uh, that occurred in, in October and to a certain extent the, uh, the uh, regional elections that occurred after that. Um, uh, really, the, the pace of things has sort of stayed the same. Uh, a lot of the references, the program is essentially the same. Uh, I think that's part of the reason there hasn't been as much sort of debate about some of the big issues because that, that was sort of covered uh, back uh, last year. Uh, so it, it, we're seeing a little bit of a recycling of, of the agenda of last year and kind of an intensification. Professor Smaldi, there was quite a serious critique from the left, though, of Nicolas Maduro, suggesting that maybe he should be doing a bit more, even at this stage, to put forward a, his own vision of how he's going to deepen the Bolivarian revolution and, and, and get out of Chavez's shadow. I mean, is, is that a serious criticism? Um, I think I think it's a very true fact about the campaign that it's been largely issue free and in fact there was criticism from within the Chavez camp uh, from the left saying that Maduro should come forward and put forward his proposal for the country. I think uh, I think it's entirely understandable that Maduro has not done that in the sense that he's he's the front runner one 
And as Alex just said, this is a very short campaign. So there's not really a lot of time to put forward a message and policy position. So I can certainly understand uh, his position. And I guess there'll be plenty of time to try and distinguish himself from Chavez in the, in the coming years. But let's look at these platforms then that, as you say, uh, were largely hammered out last year during the election campaign. Enrique Capriles then, the candidate of the Democratic Unity Roundtable Coalition, known as the MUD, and describes himself as a centrist. His campaign has emphasized the importance of education to bring down crime levels in the country. He's promised not to nationalize any more businesses, but he has promised to continue Hugo Chavez's welfare programs and pledged to raise the minimum wage by 40%. Nicolas Maduro is the candidate of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, known as the PSUV. He's promising to implement Hugo Chavez's socialist plan of the nation 2013 to 2019, which Chavez ran on last year, which aims to strengthen existing housing and healthcare initiatives, establish more communal councils, and build more state factories. The plan also promises to further erode the influence of large landowners through, large, through land re redistribution. Maduro also promised to raise the minimum wage by between 38 and 45 percent. It's, it's fascinating, uh, Carl, how Maduro is once again presenting himself there as, as this Lula, not Chavez, I suppose, is, is what he's saying, which is it's a distinction that Lula himself scoffs at, of course, and Lula says, you know, has supported Maduro to the hilt. Um, are we to really buy this? Capriles has also actually said he's going to increase pensions and food subsidies and medical subsidies. He's, is he really now a 21st century socialist, then? I think uh, Capriles is in a very difficult situation because he needs to be able to bridge the gap that exists between the hard Chavista supporters and some of the moderates out there. They, he needs to give them a reason to support him. And a lot of the social programs that President uh, Chavez put forward are very popular with a big group of folks. So this is his way of saying, look, I'm going to change in some areas, but in the areas that you really care about, issues that have to do with social services, uh, the misiones, a lot of the things that President Chavez was popular He's for. Like the local groupings that you know, give health care. And, and right. So forth, he, right? He, he chooses to, to, to be supportive of them and to say that they would continue under his uh, mandate. Uh, it was notable during the election, Alex, that there was some doubt raised, though, about Capriles's commitment to some of these programs after the, a document was leaked um, by the Democratic Unity Coalition uh, in uh, July. And that suggested otherwise. And, and in fact, it suggested that, um, that, that the policy was going to be very different. It was entitled Economic Actions to be Taken by the Unity Government in 2013. The document said Capriles would deregulate the banking sector, cut back on social spending, including communal councils and housing assistance, remove the, quote, nationalist ideology from the petroleum and mining sector, and cut back on the government marketplaces that sell products to a discount to the poor. Alex, I mean, are there still those suspicions that there might be some hidden agenda, or at the very least, that there are those in the opposition coalition who have no intention of carrying on the Bolivarian revolution? Well, absolutely, very much so, because, I mean, um, Capriles hasn't just emerged in the last year. Uh, he's been around and been a, an important political actor in this country uh, for, you know, close to 14, 15 years now. The Primero Justicia, his party, was created in thanks with support from the U.S., from the International Republican Institute, with a very right-wing agenda to start out with. And, of course, uh, his party, along with some other the right-wing opposition groups, supported a coup against President Chavez, uh, which was essentially a coup against some of these very reforms that he uh, is now claiming to support. And so it's very ironic to see today Capriles uh, telling uh, Maduro that he's betraying uh, Chavez's legacy. And, and we've been seeing, for instance, Capriles going around uh, in a red shirt. I mean, Carl's absolutely right. I mean, to win this election, he has to win over some of the moderate Chavistas. Uh, but I don't think it's coming across as, as sort of a very honest discourse. And you see just Last year, I mean, he was really trashing Chavez. And of course, there was this leak of a document which was essentially a sort of a Reaganomics, um, uh, a new version of Reaganomics uh, of uh, sort of uh, bringing back uh, all of these uh, social uh, uh, successes that had been uh, made where, you know, basically uh, just doing away with a lot of the social programs uh, through a system of privatization. So yes, saying we're going to hold on to the the social programs, but we're going to do this by privatizing them. Well, well, we haven't seen that as being very successful 
uh, in other states uh, that had welfare systems. Professor Smaldi, what, what do you make of it? I mean, how is part of it, I mean, the unity of the opposition and the pressures on Capriles to, on the one hand, perhaps um, accept that there's no going back to utter neoliberalism and privatization because of the the cohesion of the Bolivarian base, but on the other hand, he has to keep all these rather extremist right-wingers on board as well. Yeah, I think uh, with Capriles, if you look at it, this is, isn't just actually an electoral strategy just uh, in the past year. He, as governor in the past uh, couple years, has actually moved towards the left from his original. Originally, he sold himself and was very much a center-right politician, one of the founders of Primera Justicia. Uh, as he became a, a governor, and during the Chavez years, in which basically Chavez dragged the whole spectrum to the left, he also uh, focused much more on education, much more on health. And so, you know, I, I think, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's insincere what he's trying to do. I would say that it's not necessarily all that convincing to average people because your average person that likes the missions and for whom uh, this real emphasis of the Chavez government on social policy and reaching out to those who have been marginalized uh, uh, during the previous democracy, you know, to, to say now, okay, well now I believe Capriles is going to uh, do that better than Maduro, that's kind of a hard sell. Why wouldn't you just stay with the, uh, the, the real thing? And I think uh, Capriles is in a tough spot in the sense that he has a coalition that extends to the far right and also the campaign, the campaign finances is very vague, so it's very hard to know who's uh, bankrolling his campaign, but you can, um, you can just assume that there's a lot of people with a lot of money that have a lot of interests that Capriles has to, has to play to. And so I think that's what that document was about in September. So I think he's kind of got it uh, the best of, or the worst of both worlds in the sense that he's got the, the doubts of average uh, people and he's got the skepticism of the far right as well in his coalition. And I suppose the key is, though, that under Chavez, there was such an increase in democratic participation, clearly in the U.S., certainly. Um, there's this idea that the revolution is very top down and, Pres and Chavez was there and just bribing, you know, the poor. Um, but, but clearly that there was this, this huge uh, expansion of uh, community councils and grassroots movements. And in fact, we visited uh, one of those community councils to try, to try and find out what they were expecting from this uh, election. Um, Inside Story America has visited La Vega. Uh, it's uh, where people have been organizing from the ground up. They say that that's not going to change no matter who becomes the next president. The communal councils were the idea of our president, Hugo Rafael Chavez Frias. We as a people have a strong tradition of grassroots organizing, and that led to forming our communal council. The communal councils are part of the revolutionary process because they're a way to address all of the problems in the community. But they also make, discuss, and develop public policies. They develop the consciousness that makes participatory democracy a reality. My name is Elizabeth Ventura. I am part of the communal council. My role in this community and in this revolution began when Chavez included all of us in his battle for social equality. We all took on the struggle little by little. As a woman, as a mother, as a revolutionary, and then as a community and a people, we began stepping up and assuming these roles with our commander and his struggle. In the neighborhood of Caritera Negra, the majority of the 35 people in the communal council are women, 10 men, 25 women. And within the communal councils across the country, it's always the women who are out front and center. The role of women before was a small one in the sense that women weren't valued for their strength. Keeping up the house, taking care of children, that was the role we thought of for ourselves. Now we are soldiers, reservists, revolutionaries. I think that when our commander came into our lives, we women were still asleep. And it was an awakening, a very strong awakening, like a hurricane, a storm, a wave in our hearts. Because we as women can do more than be in the kitchen taking care of babies. We can be out in the street, we can be involved in politics. Because this revolution, no one can take it away from us. As women, we won't let that happen, ever. 
It is we, the people, who are going to continue dictating the revolutionary plan. Our ally, Maduro, is going to win the elections, certainly, but he's going to have to stay close to us, because as communal councils, as grassroots organizations, we're going to keep pushing for change in Venezuela, in Latin America, and the world. So, Carl Meacham, this is the interesting new variable, then, in the post-Chavez Venezuela, no matter who wins the election, although mm -hmm. most will assume it's Maduro who's going to win. Um, this is a pretty sophisticated democratic, uh, these are pretty sophisticated democratic participants in the system now. And if they feel that the promise of Chavez isn't being uh, delivered, then you know, they're going to be pretty vocal. It's going to be a big challenge now. This is, you know, this, this, is, this is true democracy, really. Um, well, on, on, on the one hand, you have the uh, systems or projects like the Misiones that the president, the president Chavez put forth that are very popular, as I mentioned before. Uh, the issue with some of these approaches to these problems is that you have an economy that's not doing so well anymore. So there's questions there about President Maduro, if he does win, uh, his ability to be able to continue these projects, and his ability then to be able to keep his coalition together if he's not able to keep these flagship uh, projects going forward. But are they just projects or are they key parts of a Bolivarian philosophy which you know, they're, they're going to keep going? There, I think that's know. a great question. Alex would, would probably be able to answer that better. But from my perspective, the question is, are these institutionalized? Are these ways that the government is able to grow institutionally or are they just initiatives that can go away with okay. the next leader? We're running out of time already, Alex. Very quickly then, are, are these you know, is, does the, do the economic fundamentals make, make even these, these moves forward by Chavez very precarious moving forward, and might that be Maduro's downfall? Well, actually, the economic fundamentals are quite strong, despite what you're going to read in the media. I mean, the debt level of Venezuela, its debt service is quite low at the moment. Um, sure, you have fairly high inflation, but you still have a fairly... A good growth rate, and um, of course, the economy is very much reliant on oil revenue. But um, everyone, all the experts, anticipate uh, you know the price of oil staying at a, at a relatively high rate. Um, however, I mean, it's a good point about institutionalization. A lot of these uh, programs uh, really have been uh, created because the institutions of Venezuela weren't working, and that's been a historic problem for decades now. And uh, so they had to sort of be bypassed through these social missions. And, and now, so these social missions have been, to some extent, institutionalized, but we have to see how they can be sort of brought into the fold of sort of the normal institutions of Venezuela. So I think that, that'll be a major challenge going forward. All right, we've only got two minutes left. Professor Smaldi, what about those other issues that we often hear about? The uh, crime, um, the power grid, I mean, the infrastructure. What specifics are we hearing from both candidates, really, to sort, to sort what are, you know, undeniably problems that Venezuela faces? Well, we've actually heard no specifics regarding infrastructure on either side. Well, um, Maduro did say he was studying a new mission, electricity mission. Uh, it's not clear exactly what that would mean. Maduro has mentioned the issue of citizen security, and I actually I give him a lot of credit for that because it, it's a, a place I don't think he really needed to go in this campaign. The, um, you know, Venezuela in the past four years has pushed forward with really a first-rate citizen security reform. It hasn't really showed results yet, but that's not completely unexpected. These things take a long time. And Maduro has actually emphasized, has met with some of these people and, and emphasized the, the uh, armed control uh, law that's, uh, that's being uh, run through the National Assembly right now. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done there. I think the infrastructure is going to be a huge issue over the next couple of years. And citizen security, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Maduro is going to give continuity to some of the processes that are already in place. Uh, we're going to pick up on some of those themes on our show on Monday when we'll look at the results of the election and we will have, a, have more time to look at, at what is next for Venezuela. But uh, very quickly, Professor Smiley, as far as this election is concerned, we have these reports about the opposition not, potentially not accepting the victory, lots of rumors as usual. I mean, what, are any of these plausible? Wouldn't that be political suicide for the opposition? Yeah, I think it would. I think uh, the rumors that I've heard, you know, I, I think uh, in, in this could be if, if Maduro's margin is less than people think, if it's less than 10 points, if it's five points or so, that Capriles might delay acknowledging uh, the, the victory and just to kind of put pressure on the government. Because I think if that happens, 
the opposition is going to sense weakness in Maduro, and they're very much going to be organizing for a recall referendum in two or three years. And so something like that could happen. But Capriles uh, has recognized, recognized immediately last time, and I think the opposition has learned has really learned from its mistakes in the past, and I doubt that there's going to be any real uh, rejection of the electoral result. Professor David Smaldi, thank you very much. Alex Main, thank you. Carl Meacham, thank you as well. And that's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.